morning to everybody watching online. If you're in Westside, my name is Pete, and I'm uh, one of the pastors here. And this is week two of a series that we're calling He Gets Us. And just to get everybody on the same page, let me just decode who he is. We're talking about Jesus. And this series is a bit of a, it's kind of like an extension of the celebration that we just came from called Christmas, where we celebrate that God became human, that God became one of us. And because our God became one of us, we can say something that no other religion can say, which is that he gets us. Our God, the God embodied in Jesus, the God revealed to us in the person, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, that God gets the human experience. And so we're doing this eight-week series talking about these different experiences that we all have as humans and just tagging them with, God gets it. He knows intimately what it's like to be human. And so this morning, what I want to talk about is an experience that we all have. Maybe some of you are having it right now. It's the human experience of anger. Anger. The inescapable, I would say, experience of human anger. Have you ever been just going through your day, things were going well, and then suddenly anger, anger came out of nowhere. One time, uh, when I was a pastor in London, I remember I was driving to our prayer meeting. It was in the morning, all the pastors getting ready to pray Tuesday morning. And I remember I was memorizing some scripture because it was like part of a, a thing I was working on. So I was memorizing something. I was in the most God mode, Pete, Pastor Pete, that you could imagine. Memorizing scripture on my way to prayer. Ah. But it was raining. It was raining. And I remember seeing off like maybe five cars ahead, a car pull out and make a very dangerous left. You know, those dangerous lefts. And I thought, surely, surely these five cars in front of me just saw what I saw. They're all attentive, paying attention to the road. And they're all going to brake slowly and we're all going to be fine. Well, no, they didn't. Suddenly in front of me, I saw... What, what terrible drivers. I, when it got my turn, I was like, no, not me. Hit the brakes. And then I was like, I'm not going to hit the guy in front of me. I pull over to the side. I'm like, ha ha, I did it. Evaded the accident. But then at the count of about one, two, oh, rear ended. And I was so angry. Not just because I was rear ended, but because I had never been in an accident before. And I thought, you're never going to get me, all you bad drivers. But somebody got me. Even right in the moment when I thought I had gotten out of it, ah, they got me. Now, I was in Pastor Pete mode, remember? I was memorizing scripture on my way to prayer. So I, I didn't get out of the car like really like ready to be angry, but there was some anger in me. And I'll never forget that the person who just smashed into me was angry at me. And they said, what the heck are you doing? I'm like, uh, I got out of the way. And they're like, my yogurt is everywhere. <laughs> which, which then when I look back at her car, I saw, oh, you were having a delicious yogurt snack. And then that's probably why you smashed into the back of my car. <laughs> which made me a little bit angry again. Anger can come, and can, can come and get you, right? It can come and get you. You may be, you, oh, I thought we were going to have a nice morning coming to church as a family. Get in the car, family. Where are you, woman? What are you doing in the bathroom? You know? Okay, I'm a man, okay? We have those experiences. Maybe some of you it's reversed, but hey. You know, anger can come get you. It's inescapable. Is anger good or bad? What do you think? Anger good or bad? It depends. I think it depends. Here's the good news. Because he gets us, he gets anger. Jesus gets anger. He knows what it's like to be angry. And by looking at his life and his teachings, we can learn from him how to live in a world that will make us angry. We can learn from him what to do with anger. Because yes, Jesus got angry too. So we're going to look at three things that we can learn from Jesus this morning. But before we get to those three things, I just want to give you a simple illustration of how I want to think about anger today, okay? When you think about anger, I'm gonna, when you think about anger, I want you to think about it as an alarm, okay? I want you to think about anger as an alarm going off. This is anger. 
This is your this is your anger speaking. Something is wrong. Something's wrong in the world. This this is anger. It's an alarm. Okay. Think of it as something's something's broken. Something's wrong. Something that I love needs to be defended. Something that I love needs to be defended. Okay. Think of it as the alarm. Now, what makes anger good or bad often has to do with where did the alarm come from and where did the alarm lead me to? So anger in itself, it depends what, what you make of it. It depends, well, what made you angry? That can define whether or not it was good or bad. And then where did it lead you to? What did it cause you to do? That can define whether it's good or bad. Think of anger this morning as an alarm that goes off. Now, we're going to learn from the life of Jesus. Well, where did his anger come from? What did it look like when he got angry? Well, in Mark chapter 3, we get a story where Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And Mark tells us that there were some teachers of the law who were always watching Jesus very carefully. They didn't, they didn't like Jesus, or at the very least, they were very suspicious of Jesus. And they knew that he was a healer. And so they were watching him, and they saw that there was a withered man in the crowd this morning. They're like, hmm, Jesus heals. I wonder if he'll heal this guy. I wonder if he'll heal this guy on the Sabbath. Sabbath was a special day where you could do no work. And the religious people had decided work includes miracles, therefore no miracles on the Sabbath. And Jesus could tell. He could tell. Somehow he could tell, like, they're watching me. They're watching me. They're watching him. They want to see, will I heal this guy on the Sabbath? So Jesus, very clever, he has the guy stand up, stand up. He has him come up to the front and he says to these teachers of the law, is it on the Sabbath? Should we do good or evil? Is it a day for life or a day for death? And they're like, oh, this is a good question. He's got us on the ropes again. And they don't answer. They say nothing. Which makes Jesus, Jesus very angry. And this is what Mark tells us happens next. It says he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, their hardened hearts. They don't want to accept him. Jesus gets angry. Why does he get angry? I want to suggest to you that it comes from a place of love. He gets angry because he's like, he loves this man with the withered hand. He loves the religious teachers. And he's like, I can't believe that you would actually deny him a miracle just because it's the Sabbath, because of some rules that you made up. And I can't believe that you have actually put your place, yourself in a place of such a hardened heart that you would be closed off to a healing just to keep up your man-made rules. I want to suggest that Jesus, he, he gets angry because he is so loving. And then what does he do next? If you don't know this story, what, is, what does he do next? Does he, does he then go, all right, fine, I'm so angry. This, what could he have done? He could have taken the guy aside. He's like, I'll heal you, but we're going to heal you in secret. He could have been so mad. He could have like rebuked the religious leaders, which sometimes he does. But in this moment, he doesn't. And I want to suggest that, that, the, that the love, that the anger came from love. And then it led him to act lovingly. This is what Jesus does. Does. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus knows that they were, they were almost like setting a trap for him. They were waiting for him to do the wrong thing. And when he does it, they just can't wait. Oh, we knew it. We knew it. Let's go plan how to kill this guy. And knowing all of that, Jesus still graces them with a miracle. He graces them with a, I, I will let you see a miracle in the hope that maybe it will soften your hardened heart. Think about the person in your life that you know. Maybe you are one of them. Maybe you're someone who doesn't believe. You don't believe in the God stuff. They're antagonistic toward God. Wouldn't one of the most gracious, loving things God could do for you is to show you a miracle? Imagine if God was like, I'll give you one miracle. You can, you can do it to your friend who doesn't believe in me. Wouldn't you be like, oh, that would be amazing. Like, wouldn't that be a gracious blessing to give them in the hopes that maybe their heart would be softened by this miracle? Jesus could have denied them that, but instead he gifts them it. 
And so here's what I want to suggest that we can learn from Jesus. Point number one, if you're a note taker, is that Jesus teaches us the flow of anger. Jesus teaches us that anger should flow from love and it should lead to love, which, which brings up a question. So where does your anger come from? Where does your anger come from when you get angry? And where does it lead you to? Another story about Jesus that it doesn't actually describe, it doesn't use the word that he was angry, but we read into it that he was angry often enough. And so let me do that again this morning. But it's told in all four of the gospel accounts that Jesus at one point goes in to the temple and he is angered. Well, we read into that he is angered by what he sees. And he's in the outer court, which is a court that was, oh, there's an outer court and there's an inner court. The inner court was only for the Jewish people. The outer court, Gentiles could come. Gentiles meaning non-Jewish people. They could come and they could be just God fearers and make sacrifices and pray to God, this God, and learn from this God. And Jesus is in the outer court that is designed for these Gentiles. And he notices that it's become a marketplace. And he says, this is supposed to be a place of prayer. This is supposed to be a place of prayer for the outsiders to our religion, and you've turned it into a marketplace? Imagine, they would, they would have these big festivals, and thousands and thousands of people would come into the city, and they're like, you know, if we put it right in the place where they want to go, the market, and we make them have to exchange money, and we could just rip them off when we do that as well, then we can make even more money. And Jesus is like, I see what you're doing, and you've turned what was supposed to be a house of prayer into a den of robbers. And after seeing this and saying this, he, he has a whip and he, and he chases the animals out and he knocks the money off their tables and he turns their tables over and he chases them out of the outer courts of the temple. And I submit to you that this was all done in love. That the anger that he displays here comes from a place of love, comes from a place of love for the Gentiles. They need this place. This is supposed to be their place. And you've turned it into a den of thieves, ripping them off as you exchange their money. It comes from a place of love. And the action is an action of love. I cannot allow this to continue here. I can't allow it for the people that are perpetrating this great injustice upon these people because it's not good for them for, to allow this to continue to go on. And I can't allow it to keep happening and the Gentiles to miss out on their space where they can encounter the God of Israel. Jesus teaches us, I think, the flow of anger. Where does your anger come from? Where does it lead you to? Where does it come from? I think the bad sources of anger are when we get angry because our ego gets hurt. Our pride gets hurt. We, we hold on to anger as a, as a way of, oh, I need to, this is how I will gain control. Those are all the bad sources of anger. But when, when our anger comes from, that's wrong. That's unjust. That system is unjust. Those people are being oppressed. That is a lie against the God that I know. That is slander against God. When it comes from these places, from these good loves, when, they're not, when, when our anger isn't a, a selfish love that is trying to protect ourselves, but is more of an external love, I, I, I'm angry because I love others. I'm angry because I love God. Then, then that's the good kind of love. Let me just stop for a moment and, and, and put this point in here. I couldn't decide where it went. It could go in many different parts of the sermon. We, we, we should be glad that we have a God who is described as angry. Not the bad kind of anger, not a God who just flies off the handle, but a God who, when he sees things that are wrong, is disturbed and moved by them. We should be glad that, a God, a God, that we have a God who hears us and when we cry out to him, he hears us, and then he moves on our behalf when we are being oppressed, when there is injustice moving against us. We should be glad, because another type of God that is just apathetic, that is just stoically removed, who just watches evil happen and isn't moved, well, that wouldn't be a good God at all. And I think that he wants us to be the same way, to be moved to anger, and have our anger lead us in the same way that he's moved, in the same way that he acts. Sometimes I think that you can get the idea that like, to be a good Christian is to not be angry, 
To be a good Christian. I am unbothered. I, I, I am seated in heavenly places and unbothered by all of the feeble circumstances of you humans. And to just pretend like I, I don't get angry. I heard a story once about a guy in a small group. And he told the small group, I never get angry. And they all started laughing at him. And then he got furious. <laughs> and they all just have a laugh about that now from time to time. I think that that's a wrong picture. We, we should get angry. We should hear the alarm go off at the right things. And our anger should come from love and it should lead us into love. Second thing that we can learn from Jesus, we got the flow of anger. We got the slow to anger. Yes, flow and slow rhyme. Get ready for number three. <laughs> the slow to anger. One of the most, uh, there, there's, a, there's a couple of phrases used throughout the Old Testament over and over and over to describe the character of God. And within these phrases, you get the, the, the line that God is slow to anger. It's a, it's a key part of his character as we think about, about his anger. Yes, he gets angry, but he is slow to anger. And I want to read for you uh, where we, one place where we get this. We get it many places, but in Psalm 103, where God is described in this way. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. There is this God who is angry, who we want to be angry at the evil in the world. And yet his anger is always this slow anger, this patient anger. Anger. I need to be angry because I, I can't be apathetic to the evil, but I also love humans so much that I don't want to destroy them. And I recognize that they are but dust, but with one T, but dust. <laughs> I couldn't help my mind from going there. He remembers that we are weak, and so he is slow because he wants us to experience his love and his redemption and to turn from our evil ways. Jesus teaches us the flow. He teaches us the slow to anger. In one of the books that's a, a wisdom book in the Bible, it's called the book of Proverbs. We get all of these, these great wisdom sayings, and we are encouraged to also be slow to anger in one of these sayings. Proverbs 16, 32 says this, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Being slow to anger, that is true power. True power, no, true power is, that's wrong. Oh, watch me flex my muscles. No, 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 no. Way more powerful than that. The ability to say, that is wrong. What is the loving response to this? How, does, how, does, how can I be slow and thoughtful in how I respond to this wrong, evil that I see in the world? Back to Jesus in the temple. I think that we see Jesus model this for us. In the temple, we sometimes, maybe if, you, if you've just heard this story before, maybe you've seen it portrayed in a film, it feels or seems as though Jesus walks into the temple, he sees something wrong, he goes, this is all wrong, when he just starts flipping over tables. But we know that Jesus, this wasn't his first time in the temple. Jesus went to the temple when he was a little boy. And likely as a good Jewish person, as he grew up, he went to the temple religiously many times a year during the different festivals where you would go to the temple. And so, so over his 30 to 33 years before we get to the temple moment, we can assume that Jesus has been at the temple many, many times during the high festival seasons. And he had seen the money changers in the outer courts before. And so I think, I think we can attach to this, that Jesus is slow to this anger that we he see displayed that he would have come there as maybe 10, 10 years old and he, they come through the outer courts and he's like, dad, 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 why? What is going on here? He's like, yeah, I know it's wrong. And he learns like, this is wrong. This isn't what it's supposed to look like. And he comes back another year. He's like, this is so wrong that this is happening here. This, this, this house of prayer has become a den of thieves. And year after year, he feels this. And one day after his ministry has begun, 
he decides, I must speak to this injustice. I have to move. I've had lots of time to think about what the right response would be, and now I've decided this is the right thing to do. And then even within the story, it's not like he sees it and immediately like he sees like the first table he sees, he's like, boom, kicks it over. It says he sees it and then he goes and makes a whip. He makes, you ever make a whip? Man, if I had to make a whip, it'd take a week. I'll be back in a week to chase these guys out. But he at least probably sits down and he starts braiding together a whip. Again, there's a slowness to this, a patience to this. And then I think that we can attach to it that that the outcome is love. He's like, I must do this radical thing so that the people who who have had their place of prayer ruined would know how much God loves them. And so that the people who have done this know how angry God is so that maybe their hardened heart, who cares only about money, would be softened. Jesus teaches us to be slow to anger. I think both in the way that he lives and his teachings and even his brother, when his brother James writes a letter, his brother James tells us the same thing, which think about James, think about being the brother of Jesus. I think he was probably, he knew a thing or two about anger. You know, be uh, like, imagine, have a, have a perfect brother. See how, see how often you feel like, oh, it's so great that he's perfect and I'm so messed up. Be, be difficult, right? James, I think, uh, sorry, James, like if you were like close, but I think he knows something about anger. He writes in his letter this, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, back to our alarm. How do many of us often live in the world? Oh, this app has an, this app has an ad that hasn't appeared all morning. There we go. That's fun. Next time, get the paid version. Come on. I think many of us live like this. You said what? You said what to me? Anger, anger immediately. Anger as quick as possible. Uh, we need you to. Uh, we need you to come in for a performance review. <laughs> Honey, um, I'd like. I'd like us to talk uh, about how how we're raising the kids. <laughs> Many of us are quick to anger, quick to defend. I got to get on top of this. I got I to smother this thing. I got to act as quickly as possible. James and Jesus teach us something different. Be slow to anger. I, I hear it. I, 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 feel, I feel a disturbance in the force, but it's far away. And I'll, I'll keep it as far away as I can while I am quick to listen, while I am, I am looking to understand before I let it get here, before I let it get to full-blown anger, I need to do something. I am going to act. I'm going to be like, should I even be angry? Is this even, is it, why am I, is this an ego thing? Is this a pride thing? Oh, no, actually, this is injustice. I should act. See that? Uh, slow to anger. Not, uh, slow. Keep it, keep it far. Keep it, keep it quelled. Be quick to listen. Figure out uh, what, what's happening here. Why, why do I feel this? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from love? Or is it coming from somewhere else? So we've got the, the flow of anger, the slow to anger, and the let go of anger. Do you think that Jesus walked around angry all the time? I don't think so. I think, I think if you think about, think about dictators that you hear about, what, what's one thing about dictators? Nobody will talk to them because you don't know what they want to hear and maybe they'll get rid of you if you say something that, that they don't want to hear. Jesus could have been like that. Like imagine he walked around and he's like, everything is wrong. Everything is wrong with you. Your heart thinks of nothing but wickedness all the time. I hate this place. I can't wait to get out of here. I think that's what it was like following Jesus on the road every day. I don't think so. I think that they, they felt like a freedom with Jesus because he wasn't angry all the time. They felt a freedom to ask dumb questions over and over. They ask one dumb question. They're like, oh, that was uncomfortable. Oh, we can ask another one. It's okay. Jesus loves us. <laughs> I don't think Jesus was angry all the time. And yet he could have been. 
He could have been angry all the time. He could have been, it was infinite things for him to be angry about as a holy God. And yet somehow he gets angry and he lets it go. He gets angry and he chooses love. Because there's something about anger that it is meant to be an alarm, not a way of being. It's meant to go off, oh, there's something wrong. Okay, now I need to act. But the anger is just the alarm. So let it go off. Oh, there's an alarm. Okay, now where did it come from? Where am I going to let it lead me to? I think Jesus is a master at doing this. I think that as, as the disciples followed him and they saw him get angry, they would also just as quickly be like, but look at how he acted with love. Look at, oh, look at how patient he was. Patient with us, patient with other people. Look at how gentle he was. Gentleness being power under control. He has so much power. We've seen him calm a storm. He told a storm just to stop. And this person who he should be so angry at, he's being so gentle with them. He has so much control. He has so much self Control. I think that would have been the experience of walking with Jesus, who is a master at dealing with anger, allowing it just to be the alarm, but not something that he was, a state of being. When we see Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, one of his most famous sermons, he teaches something very similar. He says, you've heard it said, don't murder. Of course, everybody at this point knows, don't murder each other. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you are in danger of judgment. If you are harboring anger, if you're holding on to it, you, you are in trouble. You're, you are in danger. And what you need to do, if you find yourself harboring that, and you find yourself going through religious ceremony, and you find yourself at the altar offering a gift to God, but inside there is something that you are harboring, some anger, you need to leave the gift there and go and be reconciled to your brother or sister. Go and make peace with them. This is how serious anger is. Jesus is like, do not hold on to it. It can be an alarm that goes off, but don't allow it to become a thing that you are. When Jesus gives this teaching, I think that everybody in the room would have connected it to a story that everybody knew. A story that you know if you've been doing like I've been doing, which is reading through the Bible in a year, starting January 1. You know Genesis 4, where there's two brothers who come and make an offering very similar to the images that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount. Two brothers, Cain and Abel, come to make an offering. God finds Abel's offering acceptable. He doesn't find Cain's offering acceptable. Hebrews tells us it has something to do with faith, something to do with their heart, something to do with the quality of their offering. But because Cain's offering is not acceptable, in Genesis 4, we're told that he becomes angry. He becomes angry. And God comes to him and says, Cain, I can see that you are angry but do what is right. What would it mean to do what is right? Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, do what is right. Go to your brother and make peace with him. Sin is crouching at your door like a, all like, I said this accidentally in the first service, I'll say it again, like a hidden tiger, a crouching dragon. Sin is crouching at your door looking to devour you. Go and do the right thing, which is to go be reconciled to your brother. But instead, Cain harbors it, and he lets the anger become a thing that he is, and he eventually goes out to the field and he murders his brother. Again, another connection to the, story, the, the teaching that Jesus has in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, don't murder. So he's murder and brothers and offering all in this story of Cain and Abel. And Jesus is like, don't let what happened to Cain happen to you where you become angry and you harbor it, and eventually it spills out in this vengeful hate towards your brother or sister. Ephesians puts it really simply this way. In your anger, do not sin. It's okay to be angry. You're gonna get angry. The alarm is gonna go off. But in that, do not sin. Don't let evil flow out of your anger. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Have a time limit on it. Don't see this as, I will hold on to this anger. This is who I am now. I am angry Pete forever. Have a time limit on it. I, will, I am working to let this go. And do not give the devil a foothold. He's crouching at your door, 
oh, you see that that's wrong. You, you were on Facebook and you saw something in the comments. Look at that stupid person with their stupid belief. Oh, I don't hold on to that. It's just, it's crouching at your door, looking to get a foothold in your life and lead you to respond with the same kind of evil that made you angry in the first place. Jesus teaches us the flow of anger, teaches us the slow of anger, teaches us to let go of anger. Some of us really are bad at letting go. I'd bring up my alarm again, but I can't remember which pocket it's in. I know it's in the back one. I just don't actually have time. But some of you, it's like that alarm is going off all the time. And you just, you, you like it. You're like, I need that alarm. I don't want to let it go. I'm going to hold on to it all the time. And every interaction that you have, in the background, there's an alarm. You know, remember you're angry. Remember you're angry. Remember you're angry. Remember you're angry. And it, it influences every interaction, every relationship that you have. And Jesus is like, it's not meant to be a thing that you become. It's just an alarm. And then you decide, how am I going to act after this alarm goes off? And he invites us to act in the way of love. Jesus got angry too. And he shows us how we can deal with our anger. And I think the cross maps onto this beautifully. The cross maps onto this. We see Jesus in his life. He maps this flow, slow and let go, but also the cross. The cross being the, the moment where God takes the sins of the world upon himself and dies for our sins. Jesus, fully God, fully human, dying for our sins. God looks down upon humanity and sees our evil, sees our sin, and he is angry. But why is he angry? He's angry because he loves us. He's angry because he doesn't like to see us hurt ourselves or hurt one another or defame his name and his image that is supposed to be inside of us. He's angry because he loves. And so his anger starts from a place of love. And then what does his anger do? Leads to love. The greatest act of love in human history, God dying for his enemies, for us sinners. That's the flow. And there's the slow. How long did it take for us to get to the cross? Hundreds of years, thousands of years of God's slow anger, his patience towards our anger. How long does he allow us to continue to live and breathe as we choose sin over him day after day? waiting for it. Will you respond to my gift of love? And patiently he waits. Patiently he keeps calling us because he has chosen to be slow to anger. It's a part of his character. It's just who he is. And for those of us who accept the gift of the cross, who trust in Jesus' sacrifice, who decide, I want to follow Jesus, I want to turn from this old life and follow him, well, then what we experience is the let go. We experience the God who lets go of his anger and who is no longer angry at us because we're connected to his son, Jesus. It's the flow, it's the slow, it's the let go. Jesus models it for us. We get a pinnacle moment of it on the cross. And then I think he invites us to live in the same way, to experience the peace that this brings, to experience the love that this brings into the world. So may you, may you come to see the flow of love that God has for you, that God has for the world, that, that his anger flows from his love. And may you get caught up in this flow. And may you come to see his patience for you, how patiently he waits for you, how slow to anger he is to you. And may that make you become slow to anger with the people that you interact with every day. And may you come to know that in Christ, in Jesus, God has let go of his anger, which means you can too. Would you pray with me before we go? 
Jesus, for those of us who hear these things but find them very difficult to emulate, would you help us to identify the lie that we are believing in our minds? The lie that believes we need to hang on to anger. We need to fly off the handle. It's the better way. God, help us to see that it's not to see how many times it has failed us, to see the ugliness that it creates and help us to love your way. Holy Spirit, we ask for your power, for your self-control. We ask that we would be people who bring patience into the world, who bring gentleness into the world, who bring love into the world. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you get us. In your name we pray, amen.